So I, I really want to just start with the basics of quantum physics, and like get a good grounding in it, and then I'm going to move on to something. And the, the overall theme is kind of looking at objective reality and um, looking at the kind of theories which seem to be possible to describe the world and which ones seem to be ruled out by recent, very recent experiments. So um, first of all, I just want to, this is a quote I found that I, re I think in some ways sums up what uh, the kind of thing I want to talk about. If you can't read it, I'll, I'll read it out to you. It's, it's, I recall during one walk, Einstein suddenly stopped, turned to me, and asked whether I really believe that the moon exists only when I look at it. The rest of this walk was devoted to a discussion of what a physicist should mean by the term to exist. And this is kind of what I'm going to get at. And Einstein, in particular, uh, was a very key player in this debate that I'm going to introduce you to. So, uh, before we, we get onto that, though, we've got to get some grounding in quantum physics. So, the first thing you should know about quantum physics is that no one really understands quantum physics. <laughs> so this is good. And this is Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman, who won a Nobel Prize in uh, quantum electrodynamics, very a genius. Uh, and he says this, so I, I'm quite happy to believe him. And I think what he really means is that it's, no one really understands quantum physics using the intuition we have to see about the world around us. The way we see things working, it doesn't really correlate in a, a satisfactory way with quantum physics. So obviously we can understand it on a kind of mathematical level, but I think that's very different from an intuitive level. I think that's what he kind of means here. So um, quantum physics, the theory, started developing around the 1920s. They, they found a lot of experiments weren't described really satisfactorily with uh, a lot of the theories they had. A lot of things didn't really seem to fit, and, they were, uh, and so it was very unsatisfactory. Um, it is, however, despite it being a very counterintuitive and weird theory, it's very accurate and very successful. So it's, uh, it's difficult, because it, we'd like it to be a nice intuitive theory, but it's not, so we have to kind of learn to, to live with it in some way. Um, and it's responsible for things like lasers. Obviously, lasers are very useful. Um, computers, we all use computers, that kind of technology comes about partly to an understanding of quantum physics and uh, the kind of things that people can do now, and this is uh, IBM, you, these little dots here are all atoms and they've dragged atoms into individual sites to, to write IBM and I think that kind of thing, I think for me, just blows my mind and demonstrates that it, the amount of control people have and I think mo mainly due to, the, to quantum physics and the kind of understanding we have of, uh, of that kind of thing. So I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to talk about all of quantum physics, so I'll go through a few of the highlights of quantum physics just to kind of uh, maybe refresh your memory or to tell you about it. <laughs> so one of the big things that they found when, they, uh, when quantum physics started was that sometimes things behaved as waves and sometimes behaved as particles. So for instance, they, uh, there was a, a famous experiment, maybe some of you have heard of it, where they, they just shoved loads of electrons through two little holes to see what would happen. And rather than it just seeing like, you know, you, you might expect if you throw loads of tennis balls through two holes, you'd think like, you'd be a big pile here, a big pile here, yeah? But they didn't. Instead, they kind of went through as if there were waves and kind of a bit like in a harbor maybe. There's the way water waves, they kind of interfere, it gets a bit choppy. And that's the kind of thing they saw on there, so they're very confusing. So they have this kind of wave particle duality. At the same time, the other way around, light, which they, everyone thought was a wave, there was no like, real argument about that. Um, they, they observed that actually, and this is something that Einstein really found out, they observed that light actually behaved a bit like a particle. So light kind of came in little packets of energy. So there's a bit of confusion and this kind of, uh, like I said before, it didn't really fit with anyone's intuition of what happened in every world. So that they needed some kind of new theory, some new paradigm to explain what was going on. Um, the uncertainty principle, I think, many of you, has anyone heard of the uncertainty, prin uncertainty principle? Okay, well, uh, it's the, the basic idea is that there are certain properties of a system, say an electron or an atom or an, anything really. So, and, and there's certain properties that you can't measure at the same time and with arbitrary accuracy. And uh, one, the biggest, ex uh, I think the best example is position and momentum. So if you, wanted, if you had an electron in front of you and you wanted to measure its position and its momentum at the same time, then there would be a, a limit on how accurate you could get. You could ma measure the position to arbitrary accuracy, and then you would not know anything about the momentum, or vice versa. A bit like squeezing a balloon, you know? You could like, squash it down one way or squash it down the other way, but you can't have both worlds. And there's a, a joke about this. I, I have my only physics joke. So, <laughs> um, so there's, a, there's a physicist driving down the motorway. He's driving well past the speed limit, and he gets pulled over by the policeman. 
And the policeman says, uh, excuse me, do you, know how, do you know how fast you were going? He goes, no, but I knew exactly where I was. <laughs> 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 so that's, that's the only physics joke for today. <laughs> um, some of you may have already heard of this thing called entanglement. I'm going to be speaking quite a lot on this. Uh, we're focusing on this a bit more. And Schrodinger's cat is a very famous thought experiment by Erwin Schrodinger. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this as well. So that's a kind of really broad overview of quantum physics. Um, and so as I mentioned before, we had this thing where we shoved loads of electrons through two holes, and we observed that they were kind of behaving like waves. So you might think, OK, if I get a single electron, just one electron, and I do the same thing and I fire at these two holes, well, surely now there's not going to be it. It's going to behave like a particle again, because there's only one of them. It's not going to interfere with anything. But in fact, what you see, you still see it behaving like a wave. And so this is, this is what I find quite, quite crazy. So it's as if this electron is going through both holes at the same time, coming back on itself, interfering with itself, and then making this pattern on the screen. And uh, by, by the way, I mean, these, this, this would be like, this would happen one at a time. So you only receive one electron at a time. You'd fire one at a time, and it would slowly build up into this pattern. That's uh, in case you're confused about that. So it seems weird. This electron seems to go through both holes at the same time. It exists in two places at the same time. So this is, uh, and this is something that quantum physics has to explain. Um, and it leads to the idea in, in the theory of quantum physics about superposition. So we're used to normal objects in our everyday lives um, being one thing or the other. So you had a coin, it's heads uh, or it's tails. And there's no, you know, that's, that's what happens in our everyday life. That's what we've experienced. And, and what the quantum theory seems to tell us is that we seem to have, be able to have two things that, like something like heads and tails at the same time. Very counterintuitive. It doesn't really, I mean, it's very hard to understand that. And it's not really something that, I think it's just something you get used to rather than understanding. So but this, is, this is the idea of quantum physics. You can have these kind of weird superpositions of two positions at the same time or two states at the same time. Um, and this is actually the kind of thing that leads to the, um, the paradox of Schrodinger's cat. I, like, I quite like this quote by Erwin Schrodinger. He obviously doesn't like his, his theory, even though he also won a Nobel Prize in it. So there's obviously some kind of theme there. So, <laughs> um, so this, what I've just showed you, and I, I know uh, some of you are probably questioning it, which is good. Uh, so um, I've just showed you that you can create some kind of superposition. So I mean, a heads and a tails at the same time, whatever that means. And Schrodinger kind of uh, made it more, people more aware that this is a problem because he said, well, say I have a heads and a tails. And, uh, say if I, I, I'm going to be really cruel to my cat and I put it in a box, I'm going to flip a coin. And if it's heads, I'm going to put some poison into the, the box and kill the cat. And if it's tails, I'm going <laughs> to not do anything. In fact, he, he's not going to do the measurement himself. He's going he's to isolate a box and have a little machine that reads heads or tails. And he's going to put this superposition of heads and tails inside the box and let the machine do it. And if it's heads, he kills the cat. If not, it doesn't kill the cat. So the question is, does that mean you end up somehow with some kind of superposition of a, an alive cat and a dead cat? And if so, I mean, that's quite a, a weird thing. You end up with something which is existing and non-existing at the same time. So it's, not, it's, not a, it's, a, it's a bit of a problem. And so what do we do? <laughs> um, and one of the solutions to this is you've got to think about, well, there must be some kind of link between, I've, I've, I've asserted that there's superposi superpositions in uh, the quantum world, and somehow the world we see is not full of superpositions. We see one thing, we don't see crazy superpositions. So there must be some kind of uh, transition from the quantum world to our world. And the question is, where does that happen? And this is the, the problem of, of measurement in quantum physics. So in, in normal physics, you, the idea is that you, when you measure something, you kind of have this, I mean, intuitively you have an idea that when we measure something, the property exists independent of us measuring it. And just because we don't know it doesn't mean that property doesn't exist. So for instance, if I was going to measure the height of this table, I, I think the height of that table exists, even though I don't know it. But I reveal the height of that table by, by measuring it. OK, that's pretty, pretty simple, OK? Um, and so that's the idea. You have a hidden. You, ha you, don't, you're, you don't know a certain amount of knowledge, but you reveal that knowledge. And there's nothing really crazy about that. Um, and even though we might not be able to get all the information, in principle, we believe, in, in this kind of normal, intuitive world, we believe that this information is there for us, and it exists. In, 
so that's the, that's the kind of normal idea of measurement. In the quantum idea of measurement, I'm going to take us back to the, uh, the, the electron and the, the two slits before, because I'm just going to illustrate how weird quantum measurement is. It's a very different kettle of fish. Because um, if we have our electron, say, and I've told you that I told you that it seems like it goes through both holes at the same time. You can be very clever. You say, well, okay, well, I'm going to be a bit more clever. And maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put two cameras there, and I'm going to see which hole it goes through. And then, I, and then we don't have this problem anymore. We don't have this problem of superpositions. I can find out which one it went through. Fine. So turns out if you do that, then uh, a particle it no longer behaves like a wave. It behaves like a particle. <laughs> so it's, how frustrating is that? <laughs> so. We can't really use the same idea of measurement, it seems. The measurement has, seems to interact with the, the, the system in a, in a way that's a, a little, slightly different. So in quantum theory, the idea of a measurement is that you have your superposition and that somehow this superposition will reveal an answer. So for instance, if it was your dead or alive cat, say you, you open the box to see what the cat is dead or alive, and it will reveal dead or alive. It won't be both. But the act of measurement somehow makes the system choose. I, mean, I say choose not in the, as if the system is actually choosing. But it makes the system uh, become one or the other. And, uh, and this is, according to quantum theory, this is supposed to be a non-deterministic thing. So I could open the box in exactly the same way both times and could get completely different results. So it's, it's, a, it's a probabilistic thing. The quantum theory only gives you a probabilistic account of what's going on. It doesn't give you any deterministic idea of anything. So it, it, you can't completely predict anything according to quantum theory. Um, and you may ask, well, how does this happen? I, you know, it seems a bit, seems there must be something going on here. And uh, actually, the standard version of quantum physics doesn't really tell you. All it says is that happens. So I, f I feel that's a bit of a kind of a hole in the theory, really. And uh, yeah, so I think it's a very good question <laughs> how that happens. And I, I certainly don't know. I could tell you the theories about how it happens, but I certainly couldn't tell you. Uh, and I don't think there's, there's a lot of agreement. But um, there are a lot of theories, including uh, many worlds. Some of you may have heard of many worlds before. And the idea is that instead of uh, it choosing one or the other, in fact, it chooses both and branches out into two universes that coexist which is uh, fine. I mean, that kind of resolves it in some ways, but it's not a very testable hypothesis. So as a scientist, you're kind of like, well, it, it, gets, it kind of sweeps it away to somewhere else in some ways. So. But anyway, it's, a, it's, it's just a thing called the measurement problem. I'm not going to focus too much on that, but just so you're aware of it, because um, I want to kind of move on to, I want to move on to our ideas of, of which physical theories are, are plausible and how we can find out which, which physical theories are plausible. So we've talked about this idea of superposition, where you can have two things the, uh, in the same state at the same time. And I've talked about measurement and how in a quantum uh, way, measurement doesn't really, it's not the same as uh, revealing something. You're actually changing the system and in a non-deterministic way. So there is a, there's a thing called entanglement, which is also, it's connected to superposition, and, uh, but it's a very, a very spooky thing. And it's uh, something that was hotly debated by Einstein and others uh, when it was first kind of uh, found out. Um, so before I talk about entanglement, I'll, I want to introduce you to the, the idea of kind of uh, a correlation between two things. So if, uh, if, for instance, I have a bag and I have six apples in my bag and I decide to, I just close my eyes and I've got two other bags and I just randomly put apples in two bags. And so I've got two, other, two bags with an unknown number of apples in each bag. And I decide to give one to two friends, so I give one to you and one to you. And then I ask you to open your bag, and you count the number of apples you have. And so say if you count two apples, then you know immediately that over here we have four apples, which is magic. <laughs> well, not really. So it's not magic, but it's, it's, it, it, this, is, this is fine. I mean, we, 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 we can, cause the only, and the reason this works is because the number of apples, is, it doesn't change. And uh, you can immediately know the number of apples she has just by the fact that you know the six in total. So, you know, fine. The, and that's, uh, and that's a kind of, I'd say, like a normal correlation between. So there's some correlation between these two that you, if you know this, you, know, you can infer this. In, in quantum physics, it becomes a bit trickier and a bit more interesting. So I can have a similar kind of thing. I can, can prepare some quantum state. And I'm just, I'm just telling you this now. I'm not, I'm, I'm, 
so you might, might have to trust me a little bit. <laughs> uh, I can prepare some quantum state that if I measure, so that's a non-quantum, if I have some quantum state and I, I, I prepared these two things in a certain way, that uh, they are, they're in a special kind of quantum state. And if I measure this one, even though it, has, it's, it's in a, it's, it isn't in a definite state, I measure it and I make it decide that it's going to be up, say, whatever that means. It could be anything. That could be a zero, that could be a one. So I measure it, and it's, it's an up. And I can prepare these states in such a way, according to quantum theory, that this one has to be the opposite. And I could do exactly the same. I could measure this again, and it might be a down. This one has to be an up. And now the difference here is, when I gave you these two bags, there's the idea that I'm giving you the bags, and the number inside you know is fixed. Just like when I was talking about measurement, you have this idea that there is an existence of a certain number of apples in that bag, and that doesn't change. Here, however, there is no underlying number of apples, or there's no underlying state, according to quantum theory. According to quantum theory, this is in an indeterminate state, and I ch make it choose a state by measuring it, which immediately has an effect on this other, say, electron. And these can be, these can be at the other end of, of the universe, and this would still hold according to quantum physics. And so this is uh, something very, very weird. And Einstein hated this. He didn't like this at all. Um, because it means that you can have something that appears to travel, ha have an interaction with something else faster than the speed of light, which is obviously very weird. And Einstein, of course, coming up with special relativity, he didn't like that because he proposed that the speed of light was the maximum speed that anything can possibly go. So this is very weird. And, um, this is something uh, called non-locality. This thing is a non -effect, it's being able to affect something that isn't in its immediate vic vicinity. So this is a non-locality. I'm, I'm using this terminology because it's going to be useful later. And if you're interested, this is actually also, there's actually a way to use this to do teleportation, <laughs> which is kind of uh, the field I work in. I don't work in teleportation, but <laughs> I'd be a rich man if I... But, um, you can actually, I mean, there's ways to teleport a quantum, say, if you have a, an electron in a certain quantum state, you can actually, there's ways to use this uh, entanglement thing to transport it, this, the actual state of it, to a, some distant location. But there is a clause, because you can't do it faster than the speed of light, unfortunately. Although these have an interaction faster than the speed of light, you still have to phone up your friend. Say if you make a measurement and you do something over here, you have to phone up your friend and say, well, the re result of my measurement was this. And that seems to be the clause. You can't send information faster than the speed of light. It seems. It seems that's like a, quite a solid principle. Uh, and just, uh, I thought this was quite cool to show you about entanglement. If you want to get a quantum marriage, there's an artist called Jonathan Keats who shines, illuminates you and your partner with entangled photons. So you have some kind of bond between you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, um, it, it depends on trust, because if you try and measure that entanglement and look at it, it destroys it. So. It, you have to have some trust, and uh, it's, I think it's quite cool. <laughs> He's a very eccentric guy, Jonathan Keats. OK, so we've talked about all this quantum stuff, and you might be thinking, like, uh, hopefully everyone's followed by now. I, hope I, haven't, uh, I haven't been going too fast. Everyone, you might be thinking, hold on, OK, so I've said that this thing has an indeterministic process. I measure it, and I get an indeterministic result out. And you might be thinking, well, how do I know that? How do I know that my coin wasn't in a, uh, a specific state because all I can see is the output. I can't, I can't really see this superposition. So how do I know? Um, so I, what I mean is like, the, all I see is this output, and I'm, I'm telling you it's a superposition. But how do I know that there, isn't, there wasn't some kind of fixed variable that actually determined my output, and I'm just not clever enough to see it? I.e., how do I know that quantum physics is, not, is just incomplete, and it's just, uh, it's just an approximation? And an example of this would be, say, thermodynamics. If you, you, know, th uh, if you can measure the temperature, the temperature of something, uh, like, a, like a cup, but really uh, people looked further and they found that the temperature could be expressed in terms of the, the action of the molecules. So you have some underlying physics, which really determines the, the thing you see. But um, you, you obviously, they weren't, just clever, they weren't good enough to see it yet, and it took a while to develop that theory. So this is exactly what Einstein said, actually. And this is his famous quote, you might have heard, God does not play dice. And this is his idea. He doesn't believe in this non-deterministic idea that measurement just somehow randomly chooses a, a result. And this is uh, what Niels Bohr replied. Niels Bohr, another physicist, replied to this was, 
stop telling God what to do. <laughs> so, and this kind of introduces us to this a debate which uh, was very crucial in the development of quantum physics. And it's, it's between Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. It was between other people as well, but I think these, are the, these guys are the key kind of um, guys. So Einstein versus Bohr. On one hand, Einstein said, well, I think quantum mechanics is incomplete. I think you're missing something, and there's some kind of uh, deterministic way of describing it, but you're just not clever enough to see it. And Niels Bohr said, well, I, I think quantum theory is correct. I think that the underlying reality is actually affected by how we look at it in this non-deterministic way. So I'm going to call these realism and non-realism. Uh, or this is also called the, the Copenhagen interpretation for anyone who's interested in that. Um, so we have these two ideas about the underlying reality of, uh, and, uh, and whether quantum mechanics is true or not. Um, and just to summarize, so we have the idea that we have this idea that there's some kind of um, local, as in there's no interaction between these two, and realistic, as in the underlying reality is fixed, and we just reveal it. We don't affect it by the measurement. That's a call, I call that a local and realistic theory. Um, and we, so we've seen it before. And then the quantum theory, as I said before, these things have some kind of uh, interaction, an instantaneous interaction somehow. And this is, in, not, this is not a deterministic thing. It happens by us measuring it. Um, so I'm going to call that. And so that's the, the non-local and non-realistic theory. So we have these two opposite arguments about what can be, what describes the world better. This kind of theory, where actually our theory is incomplete, or this kind of theory, where spooky things happen at long, at long ranges. And so, you, and so for a while, people thought, OK, this is, it's all very well thinking about this, but this is the kind of realm of philosophy. There's no point really in thinking about it. The experiments work, so just leave it. You know. And actually, it turns out there is a way to find out which one of these theories is correct, which I personally, this is something I found out reasonably recently, and it, it blew my mind. Um, and this is Bell's theorem. Bell is a, a Northern Ireland, was a Northern Irish physicist. He came up with a way, an experiment you can do, an experiment you can do in the lab to, to find out if the universe is it local and realistic, or if it has some kind of spooky connection and some kind of non-deterministic uh, thing. So we have this spooky thing or, or not. <laughs> That's the best I can describe it, spooky or not spooky. Um, and if his theorem is based on this concept of entanglement, if, tang if entanglement truly is this non-local weird thing that happens at long distances, then we can do an experiment. And if it's the result over, we have to do it a lot of times, if the result is over, a, is over a certain number, then that rules out a local and realistic theory completely. Um, and that, it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what your local and realistic theory is. Any, if, this, if, this result is the result, if the result you get is over a certain number, any local and realistic theory you can come up with will not work. So that's, I think that's quite amazing. It doesn't matter what the local and realistic theory is. Um, Any one you come up with. If, if this result is true, it will, uh, will not be correct. Sorry. So, so, this is re so that theory was back in 1981. He came up with that theory. Um, and I th or maybe it was a bit early, actually, I think. And the first experiment was done in 1981 on this. And since then, there's been a lot of experiments. And all of them, so far, rule out a local and realistic theory. And that means they're above this certain threshold. And they, so they rule out this idea that it can be local and realistic. I have to tell you, though, there are loopholes in these theories. So although each experiment has different loopholes, so some of them, for instance, weren't far enough apart, and some of them, they didn't take enough results. And so there are small loopholes that need to be uh, filled in. Um, so it's not, it's not a dead cert at the moment. But um, th other, people are set, um, other people assure me that there will be experiments soon that don't have loopholes that will be able to. Um, verify it completely. Um, so yeah, so although it looks like quantum physics is completely correct, correct, we can't rule out a local realistic theory. And the current research that is uh, looking at finding out for certain whether, which kind of theory it is. So I hope that was, uh, <laughs> that's actually where I'm going to stop. That's, uh, that's another experiment which was in 10, uh, 18 kilometers apart where they were doing this experiment because it needs to be very far apart. I thought it was quite interesting, underground and uh, near Lake Geneva. And so, so that's it.
but that's the end of my talk. I hope that was not too fast. I know it's, it seems like quite a short time to be talking so much about quantum physics, but I thought maybe at least if we got, if I gave you some ideas, some seeds, then maybe we can talk about it. If you've got questions, ask me. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.